Episode 163, Finding Connection Through Vulnerability with Michelle Gardeman. Welcome to Latter-day Life Coaches, the podcast where each episode is a conversation between me, Heather Rackham, and one of my amazing coach colleagues. Each coach here is a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and a highly trained, experienced life coach making a great impact in the lives of their clients. And together, we have one main goal, helping you live your best life no matter what. You ready for this conversation with the coach? Here we go. It goes against our natural instinct. The last thing we think will be effective in connecting to others is to expose our most vulnerable selves. And yet, vulnerability is the very thing that drives connection between ourselves and others. Coach Michelle Gardeman is on the podcast today talking about how when she was finally willing to get vulnerable in her marriage, That is when she started to see more compassion from her husband and felt a greater connection to him. Michelle works with wives of bishops. She has a great perspective on the struggles that these women often have and how they can be sure that the relationship with their husband does not suffer at the expense of his calling. It takes a lot of connection and vulnerability to maintain any relationship, but especially one that is under a lot of pressure. If this is a struggle for you, we know you will find validation and understanding for your situation in this episode. Please enjoy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. I have Coach Michelle Gardeman with me today. Hey, Michelle, how are you? Hello, Heather. Good morning. It's so good to see you. <laughs> you too. I almost said, hey, Coach, instead of <laughs> Michelle. <laughs> oh, it's so fun to see you too. Michelle and I live in the same state. We're both in Idaho because she's a little bit more north than I am, but I always think it's fun to have a fellow Idahoan here with me. So it's but, also funny to me because we live in different time zones. Yes, we do. So <laughs> North Idaho, for those of you who don't know, is just, it's a little bit more disconnected from Southern Idaho and a little bit more matched up better with Oregon and Washington as far as like mm-hmm. the things that you do, like geographically, you're just closer. So they yeah. go by the... um Pacific time zone. So you have to remember that. It's kind of strange. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I thought I would be in the same time zone as my daughter when I moved to Idaho because she's yeah. in Idaho Falls, but nope. No, no, you're not. <laughs> That's your geography time zone lesson for you, for the listeners yes. today. <laughs> anyway, Michelle, um, aside from where you live and the time zone that you live in, maybe you could introduce yourself to people you have not been on before. And I would love them to know a little bit about you and who you work with. And then we'll just go from there. Okay. Well, as you said, my name is Michelle Gardeman. I'm a certified life coach specifically for relationships. Connection is my most favorite emotion and relationships is really my jam. I coach bishop's wives. I am a former bishop's wife, been married for 36 years, and I've been through a lot of hard times in my marriage during those years, some of them because of life circumstances, some of them because of the differences my husband and I have in the way we do things and communicate. But that time while he was bishop for nearly seven years, that was the hardest time in our marriage, and I couldn't understand why it was that way. We went through a lot of different phases, even during that seven years. But afterwards, I thought that when he was released, maybe the tension would ease and it would get better. It would get my normal pain in the neck husband back, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Pain in the neck only because he's so different from me. But it didn't happen that way. And we went through a lot of times therapy and counseling, trying to heal. It did make a difference. But when I discovered coaching about five years ago, well, six years now, all of a sudden, all the things I had been learning in counseling came back to me in a way that came to my core. And I remember when we were in counseling, I felt like things I'd get aha moments sitting in the therapist's office. She was amazing. She was a member of the church who who was in our stake, and I loved her. And she kept trying to, I think, teach me things that I 
wasn't quite grasping. So when we weren't in her office, you know, a few weeks later, I would find myself struggling and being so frustrated and just irritated all the time with every little thing my husband did. And I thought it was all his fault. And I would text her or I would call her and say, he's doing it again, as if she was going to help me fix him Mm -hmm. at our next appointment or something. Mm -hmm. But when I discovered coaching, all of a sudden, all the things that she'd been trying to teach me to handle things myself instead of needing an intermediary all the time, it all really got into my core. And within a very short time, it seemed long then, but within a very short time, like six months, I would say, I had learned learned so many things about myself and how I was behaving in the relationship and what I was expecting from him that he just wasn't capable of that I completely turned my relationship around 180 degrees without him having to change or accommodate my emotions. I was in love again. I was just like falling madly in love with my husband again. And our next anniversary, we were just like kids. It was like our first anniversary or something. We were both so enjoying our time together. And I just thought I had been listening to a podcast, a Brooks podcast, the Life Coach School podcast. And I would tell everyone I knew about the things I was learning. I was like, oh my gosh, you guys, you don't have to feel bad in your relationships. Here's all these things that I've learned. And I realized this is a life coach school podcast. I should go to this school and become a coach. And I had no idea how I was going to do it, but I made a goal and I found a way. And once I was in certification, I kind of thought, who do I want to help? What, who do I want to coach? And I knew I wanted it to be relationships. And I thought, well, what's my experience? The hardest things I've ever done in my life were, being a bishop's wife and being a parent to teenagers who were going through health challenges and things in their high school years. And um, I have a passion for youth. Uh, I serve in young women's. I absolutely love it. But the thing I felt like I could help the most with was bishop's wives who may be struggling feeling, you know, we all think we know how hard it is to be a bishop's wife. Your husband's gone all the time. They're busy. They're serving. You're home. You're you're getting the kids to church all by yourself, all those things. And all that is true, but there's so much more to it. And the things that I experienced surprised me. Like he spent a lot of time in his office counseling other couples while I was at home feeling so disconnected, so unappreciated, so unloved. And I was hurting. And he was off counseling other people on their marriages. And he would get letters in the mail from those couples thanking them, thanking him for saving their marriage. And I just thought, you never talk to me about emotions or anything like that. And it was a really hard time. So I ended up feeling a lot of resentment towards him not being there for me, towards members of the ward who were getting his attention more than me, toward members of the ward who it would get back to me that they were scrutinizing my children. You know, your daughter's skirt is a little too short. And that would come back to me through my husband. And I, it was a really hard time. Mm -hmm. And so I thought if there are women out there who are experiencing some of those things that I experienced, um, feeling resentment and the bitterness and, and towards either their husband or members of the ward or anything like that. And then feeling shame and guilt Mm -hmm for feeling the resentment towards your husband who's just serving, there's no reason to have that shame or that guilt. 
it's normal to experience those feelings and I can show people how to allow themselves to feel them and to find a way out if they want it. Mm -hmm. So that's my long introduction. Oh, I am glad for your long introduction. Whether or not, as, you know, you've had a spouse that has served as a bishop or, I, I mean, I would say elders, corn president, it's a state mm -hmm. presidency, like high counselor, all of those things yeah. takes them out of our home and, and away from our relationships at times. And I think that there's so many people that can relate with what you're saying. And I think it's also important to note that at times we are the flip side of that too, right? Like I've had some callings that have taken yeah. me away a lot more than um, than I necessarily wanted to be. And mm -hmm. being able to be compassionate and understanding mm -hmm. of that, you know, with my husband as well. So I, I mean, yeah. I just think the things that you're saying are good for us to recognize on both sides of the coin. There's also the aspect of being a parent while you are serving in a high demand calling or while your spouse is serving in a high demand calling. All of those are things that <clears throat> I can really relate to that really speak to me. I was serving in the stake and women's presidency and going to girls camp and stake activities. Our stake is very widespread. So it was several hours drive out and back and going to all the ward conferences. So Yes, I've been on that side of it as well. My husband is currently serving as elders quorum president. I toyed around with the idea of saying, oh, I'll coach all spouses of any church leaders because of what you just said. Mm -hmm. But it felt too broad. It felt difficult to reach mm -hmm. and explain to people. Mm -hmm. So I thought, bishop's wives, I have experience mm -hmm. there. And I I would coach and help anybody who hears that and says, oh, yeah, well, I'm dealing with those feelings while my husband's serving in elders quorum. I'm not going to turn anybody away, but yeah, Bishop yeah, Spice are really my passion. I'm glad that you clarify that because there's a difference. Like we all as coaches, we have the ability to help mm -hmm. many people in different situations, but then we also have to have a, a business side as yeah. well, where we have to know how to reach out to people. And so we do have to speak a little specifically when yeah. we are talking to an audience so that people can be related, they, they people relate to us. So, yeah. and I would say for sure, there are times when I would say I'm not qualified to help somebody with this situation. And you would say, right. I'm not qualified to help you with that situation. That is part of, that's part of our limitations. And part of what makes yeah. somebody a good coach is them being willing to say, you know what, this isn't for me. You'd be better served by finding somebody else. So, right. Right. Yeah. And I, that's what I love about the directory is that I know I have, I have references for people who could help in a more specific way either from their experience coaching people in those situations or from their own personal experience. Yeah. So I love that you have kind of gathered everyone in this place where I feel safe referring someone to someone else. Yeah. Well, thank you. And I'm glad you're here. It is really, it's a treat for me to be able to connect with all of you guys. So, you know, when you were introducing yourself and, and how you, came to be where you are right mm -hmm. now. One of the things you said was you were seeing a counselor and you wanted to fix your husband. There were things mm -hmm. you wanted to fix in him. And darn it, if that's not the reason why most people go to counseling or couples counseling is because they yes. are like, I got to fix him or I got to fix her, right? Like it's yes. always about the other person. And there is something so magical, I think, about discovering that while, yes, there are things that somebody can change, we can't make anybody do that. And it feels very, um, it feels like you're hitting your head against a brick wall over and over and over again. Yeah. And the more you try, the more clouded your vision becomes. Yeah. That was the thing that was so eye-opening to me when... I discovered coaching tools was when we were in counseling, it was couples counseling. She would meet with him for an hour and then I would come in and join for an hour and then he would leave and she would meet with me for an hour. 
so that we each had our time to discuss things that might be uncomfortable to discuss in front of the other person. Mm -hmm. But we were also there together to hear her counsel. And she would kind of, if I shared something with her privately that I really wanted him to know, but I didn't know how to share it with him, she would sometimes bring it up in our couple time together. And I thought somehow that that was secretly going to get into his mind. Oh, she's telling me I need to fix this or change that. And that's not how it works. Mm -hmm. But what I, what I loved about when everything shifted for me was it was literally a moment. I don't remember which podcast episode I was listening to. I don't remember what the topic was or what was being said, but all of a sudden I realized I don't have to blame him for everything. It's okay. Like I thought I could only feel good if I was doing everything I could and he was doing it wrong. And if I could think he's doing it all wrong and I'm doing everything I can. But when I realized I'm just a human too, and I make mistakes, we all logically know that, but I felt empowered. Mm -hmm. And that's not a feeling that was part of my vocab, my emotional vocabulary before. Mm -hmm. And feeling empowered to make a difference in my relationship without needing him to do anything different was just it was so enlightening. And as time has gone by, like that one anniversary I was talking to you about, I remember feeling free to talk to him about my emotions that over that weekend where we were relaxed and we had gone away for the weekend. And because I did, he opened up a little bit. And I was like, wow, that was amazing. He doesn't talk about things like that normally. And over the years, I have seen a shift in him as well, which I've even asked him about if he notices it. He tells me he doesn't. He's like, what are you talking about? I'm still me. I'm still the same. He doesn't even recognize it. But I see a shift in him and it's it's brought both of us closer together, strengthened our testimonies. And helped us recognize the Lord's hand in so many aspects of our lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell my clients, oh yeah, if you change first, you know, eventually he'll change. Mm -hmm. But cause I don't think that's the goal, but it, yeah. it typically does happen a little bit. Well, we are in a relationship for a reason, right? We're in a relationship with somebody because we do want connection. We do mm -hmm. want, we want to feel loved, even though that's something we get to, we can do on our own. Obviously right. other people that we're in a relationship with have an influence on that. Mm -hmm. And so the things that you do influence the way your husband acts and behaves and vice versa, mm -hmm. the things he does influence you. And so I think when you said you felt so empowered, that comes from you realizing all of a sudden, yes, my husband can do things that influence me, but regardless of what he does, I still have the ability to, mm -hmm. to react and behave differently myself. And when yeah. we're no longer blaming somebody else and we're able to just take ownership of like, oh, I can do this. I can react differently. I can yeah. think differently. We no longer are dependent upon somebody else to change in order for us to yeah. Feel I think what it's like feel. it's like a symbiotic balance yeah. of the influence we have on each other, and yet we still have agency to choose how we're going to think, how we're going to feel, how we're going to behave, yeah. regardless of what they do. Mm -hmm. So yes, I believe that all those years of me slowly withdrawing and pulling more and more away to protect my emotions that I didn't think were safe with him. Mm -hmm. I think that influenced him to kind of be afraid to talk to me about it. And uh, the more I relaxed and opened up to him, 
the more he drew closer to me. And it's it just makes so much sense. We're we're taught that that's how we draw near to our heavenly Father. I think all relationships are designed to be that way. When we open up and relax and allow them in, they want to be there. But if we're nervous and tight and pulled away and putting up walls, they're afraid too and they back off. So if we want that connection that that we're we're wired to desire connection, that's how we get it is we go first, we relax, we draw near. Mm-hmm. and we get to we get to find that connection. Yeah. That ability for us to be vulnerable because that's what you're talking about right there mm-hmm. is being brave, having the courage to just share a little piece of our heart and souls is very scary, but it reaps great rewards even if it doesn't solicit a different response from a partner, it, right. it helps you like, no, I'm standing up for myself. I am going to take care of me. And mm-hmm. there's something that's so empowering about that as well. And I like that you said that phrase standing up for myself, because it has been used. That phrase has been used in a way that makes us think standing up and fighting for yourself. Yeah. But, but, I don't use it that way. No. Standing up for yourself means standing up, showing up for yourself, Mm -hmm. showing up in your relationship. Mm -hmm. And again, courage and bravery were not things that were in my emotional vocabulary in years past. Uh, Vulnerability, I was good at with people that I felt safe with, you know, my sister or my daughter's even new friends that I would meet. If I felt like they were going to be a safe place for me, I loved being vulnerable with them. But for 30 years, I was afraid to be vulnerable with my eternal companion. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I felt that empowered feeling and got brave enough to be vulnerable with him, it shifted everything for me. And to be clear, like being vulnerable doesn't mean saying to a a partner, spouse, you know, I hate when you do, you know, it doesn't mean like diving in and telling them all the things that you don't like about them, because that can feel, if you think about it, that doesn't feel vulnerable. That I have done that for years and it didn't work. Yeah. Vulnerable for me was, yeah, I'm afraid to tell you this but I'm going to tell you anyway. And that was so vulnerable for me. I think we have to really pay attention to that. Like that feeling of, well, I like to think if I want to yell something out and just like (laughs) do it from a place of anger, that's actually never vulnerability. It's when I'm afraid to say something, when Mm -hmm. I'm afraid to share a piece of my heart that I know, oh, that's vulnerable. And this is probably something that needs to be said. I just need to find the way to say it. And it isn't Mm -hmm. even, it's still not attacking them. It's still not saying, I'm afraid to tell you this. I don't like this about you. It's, I feel really, you know, it's, it's approaching it from you. Like this is, Mm -hmm. this is how I feel when you that was Say exactly this to me. Yeah, that was exactly it. Me opening up my feelings, especially things about my hopes and dreams and fears. Mm-hmm. I have always admired my husband and thought of him as much more above me, basically. He's very driven. He's very hardworking. He built a business out of nothing. He just decided, hey, I'm good at fixing things. And He started a business as a handyman, and he's been very successful in supporting our family. And I remember thinking, you don't have any training. You can't do that. And watching him over the years just go, well, I'm I'm good at it. I'm just going to do it. I always thought of him as more brave than me, more skilled than me, more driven than me. And so I got more and more afraid to share myself with him because I thought he would see how small it was. And when I got brave enough to share with him, my feelings of feeling small compared to him 
that's when it allowed him that opening to show me compassion Mm -hmm. and share with me that he doesn't see me as small, but I always thought he did. And he has so many good ideas. And when he would, when I would say I was preparing a primary lesson or something, and he would share ideas with me, I thought that he thought I couldn't do it on my own, that he had better ideas than me. And he had to tell me, you know, don't forget, you could do this. What it was, is just his brain is super active and he comes up with lots of ideas and he wanted to make sure I had all the options to choose from. But I thought he saw me as small and I was afraid to let him know that I saw myself as small too. Mm-hmm. Isn't it fascinating and sad that that is what our brain goes to, right? Like your husband's <laughs> just telling you something and your brain goes to, well, he doesn't think I can do this on my own when in actuality, yeah. that's not even what he was meaning. I, I'm i remembering this morning as I was reading my scriptures and, and maybe this doesn't apply, but for some reason I'm feeling that it does, that it was when Laman and Lemuel were like, trying having to go to Laban to get the you know they were they were murmuring about going back to get the plates and they're like he has an army at his at his beck and call like he kills all these people why would he not kill us I think the phrase was why not us and I thought you know what's so interesting that their brain went to why why won't he kill us instead of why didn't they think there's been so many people in the history of the world who have been able to conquer and do the things that they want to accomplish. Why not us? You know, and Mm -hmm. we always go to the right, right. Instead of the, yes, like I can, this is me. I can do this anyway. Right. I don't know. I love showing people that when I get a new client and I show them how our brains are naturally wired to look out for what's what's dangerous in the world. And we see everything that way. And it sort of puts a negative spin on things. Mm -hmm. And everyone can relate to this when you talk about the negative self-talk we have. And we relate to each other so easily when we talk about getting down on ourselves and the negative self-talk that spins in our head. Every other human relates to it to some degree. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's so nice to show people, you know what? we have more power than we think we do over our emotions Mm -hmm. and our brains. Once we understand the way our brains work, it's still going to offer up those negative thoughts and those protective ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. But understanding the way it works, for me, the two things I love to teach people when I first uh, meet a new client is the brain science and where our feelings come from. Okay. And you kind of cut out just a little bit. What was the first one you said? Brain, the brain science, the brain science. Okay. And where our feelings come from. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I love the brain science of understanding that there's just a chemical being released into our bodies that gives us these emotions. And I have, I've had daughters who've suffered with a lot of anxiety and it would get so bad the more they thought about it and understanding, oh, it's because I'm thinking thoughts that keep releasing that chemical that's just building up in my body. If I take myself out of my head and more into the presence with my body, it allows those chemicals to dissipate in my body. And I love teaching people that. Mm -hmm. And then like giving them an example, letting them try it for themselves and experience it right there on a call with me and just to see their face light up like, whoa, I could totally feel that. That is so amazing. And then it's not scary anymore that anxiety might come and overtake you because you know where it's coming from Mm -hmm. and how to calm your nervous system. I love it. Isn't that amazing? Some people want to like, when, when we teach that or share that with them, they're like, it makes sense, but they also are like, really? And, and I, and I've read it as I've studied more, like, it's just one of the laws of nature, right? Everything Mm -hmm. is always working. It's it's called entropy. We're always working Mm -hmm. towards chaos and our brains are the same way. They're always working towards like chaos. Everything happens like that in nature. Things fall, the farther they get from a power source, the more, the more chaotic things get. 
And um, neurons are that way. Atoms are that way. The farther they get, the farther, the more chaotic it is. And so I like to remember that the more my thoughts are closer to the power source, the more godly, the more divine my thoughts are, the more peace I have inside of me because they're not, my thoughts are not moving towards entropy. They're not crazy. Um, so I, I love just, that. Isn't that a great reminder? I, that's a book. There's a book that's by Valerie Dimmick um, called living after the manner of happiness. And she talks about that a lot. And I love thinking about it that way because mm -hmm. I don't know, I, it's bringing me back to one of the things you said, when you said that you were listening to a podcast and you didn't know, you don't even know what it was, but you just had this strong feeling like, oh, I don't have to blame him for everything. And mm -hmm. like, that was a thought that came to you that was very close, I think, to the power source. It was like a divine moment when Heavenly Father yes. intervened and helped you. And I, if you think about those times we feel the most peace, it's when we have like this almost like pure clarity given to us from our heavenly parents. I, I love helping people connect to the emotion they feel when they hear the words. Yeah. Um, none of us remember the words really of a really great talk. We remember how we felt. Mm -hmm. And I love helping people get more in touch yeah. with those feelings and why they're coming to them. And like you just said, what source they're coming from. Yeah. It's so awesome. Well, you know, I can just chat about these things all day, but and I love your voice. I could just listen to your soothing voice all day. <laughs> well, one of the things that you did not share with people is that you have done audiobook narration. So obviously you've got yeah. an amazing voice for people to listen to as well. So <laughs> I was, I was just a baby narrator when one particular author heard a really quick audition I did for her, like in a rush right before going out to, on a trip. And I thought it was so rough. It was so bad. And she messaged me while I was in the airport. I, I love your voice. This was so great. That's the best I've ever heard. I want you to do all my books. So I did quite a few books for her before I quit narrating. Oh my gosh. That's, that's a little fun tidbit of information about you. So it was a very fun time. <laughs> Well, Michelle, thank you for sharing a piece of your heart with us today. And I know that there are people who have heard this and will hear this that can totally relate, whether they are a bishop's wife or just in a relationship in general. I think these yeah. things that we've talked about, uh, vulnerability, connection, all those things are things that we all need more of in our life. But before we go... Can you share with people where they can find you? Absolutely. I do have Instagram and Facebook. I haven't been active on there for about a year, but there's content on there if you want to know more about me and you can definitely contact me through that. Uh, you can also go to my website. It's just michellegardeman.com. And if you put the spelling in your notes, that will help people because yeah. there's a few extra letters in there. <laughs> I know I spell your name wrong all the time. I always want to spell Michelle with two L's instead of one L. I have a, a dear cousin to me that her, her Michelle has two L's. I and have a routine. Anyway. I just tell people it's Michelle Garden and Michelle with one L, Garden with two N's at the end and an E in the middle. Perfect. Yep. <laughs> we will put that in the show notes. We'll put all those links in the show notes so people can find you easily. Thank you so much for being with me today. And thank you to our audience for listening and share this with those that you love. Thank you, Heather. Hey, we just wanted to thank you for spending part of your day here with us at Latter-day Life Coaches and being part of this conversation. Share this with your friends so that you can have a conversation with them on this topic as well. And as always, subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Have a good one, my friends.